This work uses examples of responsiveness to unique objects, places and occasions in traditional Japanese architecture to identify strategies for designing contemporary built environments to meet three basic human needs – identity, orientation and presence. Japanese built responsiveness to unique events in materials, space and time appears to have had its origins in the recognition of how, where and when spirits known as kami manifested themselves in the world. It is argued that the built acknowledgement of these spirits was actually a projection of a fundamental human need to affirm the nature of our own being. It is suggested that this need transcends time and culture and that many of the strategies used to express it in traditional Japanese buildings are relevant to the design of built environments today. Specifically, it is suggested that buildings can be understood as artificial bodies, mediating between ourselves and the world at large. As such, it is argued that they can not only help us to affirm what, where and when we are as individuals, but also help us to effectively share the normally personal experiences of this, here and now. Recognition of our individual physical embodiment is an important part of affirming not only what, but also to a considerable extent who we are, in other words, our identity. It is our body that defines a unique this for each of us, as an inherently subjective measure of the proximity of other things. The ultimate this, however, the closest any thing can come to us, is the body itself. It is our body that also exemplifies the second meaning of this as a particular object. The widespread appeal of unique objects appears to be connected to our need to affirm the singularity of our own being. One of the stereotypes of Japanese as a race, however, is that as part of a group-based society they don't feel the need to express their individuality to the same degree as other cultures. Yet there are more than a dozen words meaning singular or unparalleled in the Japanese language today and a fascination with unique objects was central to Shinto and hence Japanese culture from its very beginning. In early Japan, all natural phenomena were considered to be manifestations of kami. Unusual forms were seen as expressions of exceptional power, however, and were actively acknowledged tectonically. Such singular objects which included unusual trees, rocks, and even exceptional human beings, were considered to be shintai, or spirit bodies, and were typically wrapped with a rice straw taboo rope as a means of both placating and containing the kami. This early Japanese reverence for unique objects was later carried into buildings in the form of individually recognizable tree trunks that were central to both the tea room and the traditional sakia style domestic interior it inspired. Shinto appreciation of natural patterns was eventually raised to the level of a conscious aesthetic ideal in medieval Japan, most famously in the late 16th century notion of wabi associated with the tea ritual. This reverence for natural materials was then extended by tea masters such as Senrikyu into a respect for all spontaneous material effects. This included flaws and inconsistencies, which made roughly made Korean rice bowls, for example, especially prized as tea utensils in Japan. Rikyo also extended appreciation of the individual to include the personal taste of the host in both the design of the tea room and the selection of utensils for each tea gathering. The message was clear, every object and event is inherently unique, and so repetition of any kind, be it in colour, form or material, was studiously avoided in the selection of utensils for each tea gathering. After confirming what we are, knowing where comes a close second. Anthropolo anthropologist Merceau Eliadi went so far as to suggest that nothing can begin, nothing can be done without a previous orientation, and any orientation implies acquiring a fixed point. 
recognisable places allow us to locate ourselves then. Indeed, without such landmarks we would literally be lost. Eliade's account of how humans first found their way in the world, essentially by using recognisable places in the landscape where something out of the ordinary had occurred, is an almost perfect description of the early Japanese response to the extraordinary nature. Something that does not belong to this world has manifested itself appendectally, and in so doing has indicated an orientation or determined a course of conduct. Recognisable objects in the landscape not only provided the early Japanese with a source of orientation, but also meaning. These natural features constituted the first places in Japan, and their identity was actively reinforced architecturally by being enclosed with taboo ropes. These first recognisable places in nature were effectively decided by the kami, but buildings enabled the Japanese to create new places in locations of their own choosing. This was achieved through two main strategies, both of which involved the culturalization of nature, bringing relocated tree trunks into built enclosures and integrating features of the landscape directly into built forms. The first approach created object-centered built places. The second strategy of integrating features of the topography and surrounding scenery gave both buildings and those who occupied them a sense of belonging to a place. Borrowed scenery merging a distant natural landmark with a built foreground. Most of the natural objects singled out for built recognition by the early Japanese were considered to be yorishiro, or things into which kami descend. The spirits were believed to occupy these material bodies only temporarily, which made knowing when they came and went critical. The fact that the kami were invisible was, overcoming, was overcome by associating their movements with a more familiar invisible natural force, the wind. Wind-induced movement was taken as a sign of the presence of kami, and the favoured material for indicating their coming and going was paper, usually in the form of zigzag strips hanging from taboo ropes. In the jinshisai, or ground quieting ceremony, still used today to placate local kami prior to the human occupation of land, for example, it is the movement of the leaves of an evergreen sakaki branch at the centre of a temporary sacred precinct that is believed to indicate the arrival and departure of the kami. Although the idea was introduced from China, a similar belief underlies the use of furin, the ornamental bells traditionally hung from the corners of Buddhist temple roofs in Japan. Here, however, wind-induced sound is intended to discourage the entry of malevolent spirits, an example, or an early example, of building security being achieved through motion detection. Japan is unique in having developed a building type dedicated to celebrating the present. The Wabi Tea Ritu and its architectural container were essentially vehicles for extending and sharing the moment. The tea room was designed to encourage its occupants to turn inwards, literally and metaphorically, away from thoughts of, place, of other places and times and towards the here and now, the other guests and the simple act of making and sharing tea. The selection of unique combinations of utensils, art and flora for each tea gathering was a way of acknowledging the unrepeatable nature of even the most mundane of events, and was famously summed up in the Zen saying Ichigo Ichie, one time, one meeting, which roughly translates as on this one occasion. The needs of the present, the current occupants, expressed in their personal configuration of the open floor of the sikia style domestic interior.
the needs of the present expressed in the, their adjustment of the sliding screens of the Sakia style interior. Our body mediates between ourself in here and the world out there and as the basis of our subjective experiences of this here and now it helps to affirm the individual nature of our existence as a habitable form that similarly mediates between our physical self and the world at large a building can be understood as a form of artificial body in their potential to affirm the uniqueness of the self however buildings have a critical advantage over our body they can be actively designed towards this end in an essentially anthropomorphic process, Shinto sacred tree trunks, roped enclosures and paper streamers were intended to affirm the individual nature of kami by acknowledging what, where and when they were. Many of the strategies used to achieve this were subsequently employed in habitable buildings, where they effectively answered the same needs for people. Modern psychology suggests that this need for confirmation of the individual nature of our being is not confined to the Japanese, and may if anything be even more necessary today. The second part of this research examines whether any of the design strategies used to affirm the individuality in traditional Japanese buildings could potentially help to affirm what, where and when we are in contemporary built environments in general. what we are. Although buildings can be moulded to, to the particular physical characteristics of individual bodies to a limited degree, they are generally more amenable to being shaped to fit particular lifestyles. One of the best known examples of architectural self-portraiture was the Italian writer Curzio Malapart's cliff-top villa overlooking the Mediterranean on the island of Capri. Malapart claimed that the day I began building my home I didn't think I would be creating a self-portrait. Whether conscious or not, however, the fact that Malapart repeatedly described the villa as a house like me confirmed that it was in fact an expression of his own life, which was characterised by ambiguity and contradiction. In its relationship to its site, the villa likewise seemed to want to both merge at, with and at the same time dominate its natural setting. When it comes to expressing the individuality of clients, one architect in particular stands out. In fact, Bruce Goff suggested that he had never designed a house that he would personally want to live in. Goff's work was dismissed for decades as idiosyncratic, mainly because it did not employ a consistent personal style. It is only within the last 20 years that this inconsistency has been recognised for what it actually was, an unwavering expression of his clients' unique lifestyles. Made environments, then, can play an important role in affirming who, and to a lesser degree, what we are as individual beings. They can also effectively affirm where we are, affirm where we are personally, by enabling us to physically occupy centres. To sit in an armchair is to place oneself in a centre. The difference between the centre, which is our body, and made centres such as the armchair is that the latter tend to stay in one location. They enable us to dwell in a fixed place, a familiar origin to which we can return. As well as involving a unique physical embodiment in the particular location, our existence also takes place in time, and more specifically, at a given moment. Being fully present, then, entails being aware of not just where, but also when we are. In this regard, perceptible change plays a, a critical role. 
an increased sense of being present can be achieved by introducing sensory variation into indoor environments, for example. Field environments can also help to affirm our individual presence more directly by allowing us to personally in initiate changes in our environment. The act of using our body to alter our surroundings, for example, affirms our personal physical presence. In helping us to affirm, to affirm who, what, where and when we are, buildings have a major advantage over our bodies in their capacity to be actively designed to express these parameters. Buildings also possess a second key characteristic that our bodies do not. They can be occupied by more than one person. The cohabitable artificial body that is a building effectively enables us to share the normally subjective experiences of being. Buildings then offer the potential of experiencing the world essentially as others are experiencing it, a condition described by Edmund Husserl as intersubjectivity and characterized as one of the highest states of human being. Sharing this. If this for each of us is defined by direct physical contact with an object, then mutual contact with the same surface, for example, can effectively enable us to share this normally subjective experience. This goal would seem to be most readily achievable architecturally by using a common surface we are all typically in contact with most of the time anyway, the floor. It is usually only our feet that touch the floor, however, and typically we are insulated from it by footwear of some kind. The treatment of the floor in traditional Japanese buildings may be instructive here. By effectively eliminating both the furniture and the footwear that normally separate our bodies from direct contact with the floor, the traditional Japanese tatami room effectively places all of its occupants in simultaneous contact with the same surface. For each person in the space then, the floor is effectively a shared this. Built environments can also suggest the inherent uniqueness of all being, and hence by implication our own. By highlighting singular material forms or patterns, including peculiar markings and accidental flaws, the appreciation of which can again be shared with others. Sharing here. Two of the most effective ways we have seen of affirming where we are is by establishing a tangible centre or incorporating features of the natural surroundings into built forms. In addition to providing a means of orientation, the latter can also evoke a sense of belonging. Both of these needs seem to be met when built spaces are anchored on fixed natural objects, for example, and again they can evoke a powerful sense of occupying a shared here. If the location of our body defines here for each of us, then bringing people into close proximity within a confined space can likewise effectively create a shared here. Sharing now. If our personal now is defined by whatever happens to be occupying our attention at a given moment, then spaces that are designed to focus their occupants' attention on the same external event can effectively help us to share a common now. The hearth is the architectural archetype of this kind of shared focus, but purpose-designed performance spaces, for example, can achieve a similar effect. The three tectonic devices identified as most readily enabling us to effectively share the experiences of this, here and now the floor, enclosure and common focus also happen to be fundamental architectural elements. As effectively extensions of the body that mediate between ourselves and the world at large, 
Buildings would seem to have the potential then to not only help us affirm the individuality of our own being, but also to share the normally subjective existential experiences of this, here and now.